Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. And this morning's reading comes from verses 14 through to 20. Deuteronomy chapter 17, beginning at verse 14. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me, like all the other nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver or gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it, read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brother's and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. During the coronation of King Charles III, there were thousands of people who gathered in London and across the country to celebrate However, there were a small number of people who protested the event, holding simple placards reading, Not My King. Yet despite their objections, the former uh, Prince of Wales was indeed crowned the King of England and the United Kingdom. Uh, And soon after uh, entering uh, the the Promised Land, we see uh, that the children of Israel would want a king. They would want a king like the other nations. They wanted a king who would rule over them. They wanted a king who would fight for them against their enemies. And the reason they wanted a king was because they had forgotten they already had one. They had a king who had ruled over them. They had a king who had fought their battles for them. The Lord was their king. The Lord was their king who had rescued them from Pharaoh, inflicting the land with plagues. And the Lord was king who had led them and guided them out of Egypt into the promised land. And through Joshua, And through the judges of Israel, he gave them numerous victories over those who would seek to subdue them, oppress them, or force them out of the land of Canaan. And time and time again, they would call to God for rescue. They would promise wholehearted obedience. God would then come and deliver them. And they, after being delivered, would simply return to normal life. Normal life where God was not at the centre. Because like the protesters in London and even this week in Scotland, they responded with defiance, saying again and again, not my king. What is more remarkable than this is that God already knew and God already said that his people would do that. That they would behave in this way. 
In Deut- and in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 to 20, where we've just read, the Lord allowed the people to have a king despite this attitude. Look what he says in, verses, uh, four, in verse 14 uh, and verse 15. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you. Despite their protestations, not my king, God gave permission to have a king. We have been thinking about the partial kingdom as we've been looking through the book the classic Christian book written by Vaughan Roberts, uh, God's Big Picture. And the partial kingdom really has two two parts. We've been thinking about God's people living in God's place under God's rule and blessing. But in the partial kingdom, we find this additional thing uh, brought in, this this additional detail. That in, in the partial kingdom, God introduces a king who will rule over his people. And this is a theme that will continue uh, throughout the rest of our messages. And, and we, as, we've seen how, how, uh, as we've seen this, uh, this morning we're going to look at this, uh, we're going to consider this uh, in a bit more detail than would have allowed us if I had included it last week. And, and we're going to see what sort of king God permitted to rule over his people. And we're going to think about three things. Firstly, let's uh, think about the king's appointment. The king's appointment. You see, the king, the, king, the, the king of Israel wasn't to be chosen by the people through a democratic process. Uh, they, they, there weren't many candidates who would present the best case for why they would rule the land with equity and justice and they were the best man for the job and uh, therefore put themselves through a, a national election where people would turn out at the village halls and the town halls and cast their ballot for who they liked best, who was the most charismatic or dynamic, uh, who had the most integrity or not. And uh, they would, uh, that, that wasn't the process. They wanted a king but they were not a democracy. They were not to choose him for themselves without God's consent. Nor was Israel's king to reign simply because he was the oldest child or the oldest son of the previous monarch. Go and read uh, 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles, and you'll discover that sometimes the oldest son was overlooked in preference for the younger one. The, the, it, the, the kingship in Israel uh, did not depend on birthright. We, we might find that hard to, to grasp because we live in a, a, a monarchy, monarchist system where the oldest child becomes the next monarch. Well, just read about the children of David. It wasn't the oldest who became the monarch. It was the one who God chose to be monarch. Um, And so the man, that's the point really. The man who was appointed and anointed king was chosen by the sovereign will of God. In verses 14 to 17, God gives some very clear instructions for appointing his kind of king. Firstly, he gives a permission. There's the permission. Uh, We've just read verses 14 and 15. Yes, he says in verse 15, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose, one from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. 
Yes, I give you permission, says the holy God, the sovereign God of Israel, to have a king, a human king, who will rule and reign over you when you come into the land, but he is a king who must be chosen from among your own people. He must be one of you. Now let's be clear, this was not a question of ethnicity that somehow uh, the, 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 this was all based around where, uh, having the right skin colour or coming from the right country. Uh, no, uh, this wasn't about ethnicity, this was about loyalty. Specifically, it was about loyalty to the covenant of God that he made with his people at Sinai. This must be a man who is committed to the Lord God who redeemed them out of slavery in Egypt. This must be a man who will not bring foreign gods, false gods into Israel with him and lead the people into idolatry. This is not about ethnicity. This is not about uh, nationality. This is about covenant relationship. He was to be a man who belonged to the covenant and who was committed to the covenant God had made with his people to obey his law, which the very first one says, you shall have no other gods before me. This is a protection, a protection for the nation from being led into idolatrous belief and immoral practice. But with the permissions, there come some prohibitions. There are some, there's a yes, but there are some no's. In fact, there are more no's than yeses. In verses 16 to 17, look there. Only he himself must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. It's saying here, um, here, here, he, he must keep, guard his heart. He must act in a way that is right. It would have been tempting, wouldn't it, um, for the king to begin living like the kings of all the other nations? The people would have given him permission to do that. Because what did they want? A king like the kings of all the other nations. What does that include? A harem, uh, war horses, wealth. It, It includes all of those things. It includes the kings ruling like gods over the people. But that's not what this king, God's king, is to be like. He is not to be like the kings of the other nations indulging himself with or for indulging all of his sexual appetites or his uh, or his material appetites he is not to have many wives much wealth and he's not to return uh, to to those uh, to 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 trust in in alliances that that were ungodly and godless He was not there to be served by the people. He was there to be a servant of the people. In other words, he was to be a servant king. A servant king who ruled in the land with humility and trust in God. Because God's kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world. And his king, his king is not to rule like the kings of this world. Do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples? It's James and John. And they were discussing on the road, who will be the greatest? Now, um, many of us wouldn't even dare to discuss that subject. We would dare to act like it, though. And James and John just doing, being a bit bolder than what we would naturally want to do, or culturally want to do, um, they're, they're discussing who, who, who's, who's the best disciple, who's going who's gonna to rule with Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. And you remember what Jesus said? If anyone would be first, he must be last of all 
and servant of all. Servant of all. That's the king's appointment. But secondly, let's think about the king's authority. Because the kings of, of the other nations were usually lawmakers, and they, uh, they acted according to their own discretion. Uh, often, in fact, history tells us, and you can see this played out in, uh, in the Medes and the Persians, the rule of the Medes and the Persians. You remember the, Me- the rule of the Medes and the Persians? That if the king says it, it cannot be ev- ev- evoked, it cannot be taken back. Uh, it's, it's law, and it's law forever. And, 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 the, and, and even through to, 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 to Rome, uh, the, the, God, the kings of the nations were often deified by the people. Augustus uh, the, was, was given the, the title Son of God by the Romans. Um, and, and they had this, and in fact, the pharaohs were often thought to be gods incarnate. They were, they were put on this high podium, that no one could knock them down from. And, and, and this gave them the ability to say and to do whatever they chose to, whatever they wanted to. And yet in contrast, the, the only authority that the king of Israel had was the word of God in the scriptures. Notice the high priority that this king was expected to place on the word of God in verses 18 to 20. When he sits on the throne of his kingdom, verse 18, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. He was to read the scriptures. It's, did, you, did you watch the coronation of King Charles III? Uh, there he was, um, uh, he in kind of uh, sat, sat on that really old wooden throne and um, he, he's, he's receiving all of these gifts, and he receives a Bible. He receives a Bible. And, and that's tradition uh, for, for, king, for monarchs in this nation to receive a Bible. And this goes all the way back, and it, it was fascinating to see how all of those things at the coronation have been informed by the Scriptures and by our Christian heritage, because that tradition of giving a king his own copy of God's word, the Bible, originates with the kings of Israel, who were to have their own copy of God's law. But our own monarchs have cheated a little bit. Because the monarchs of Israel were not simply to have their own copy of God's law brought from Christian books Dunstable. They were to have a copy of God's law written out by themselves. You ever tried to do that? It's, a good, it's actually a good practice. If you, want to, if, you, if you struggle to remember what God's word says, be a king and write it out. Because that's what the king of Israel was to do. Upon becoming king, he was to receive a book and he was to write the law of God in it. And it would be checked by the Levitical priests in order to ensure he had not taken away from it or added to it. Because here is a king under authority of God. He is not in the position where he can say, well, I don't like that policy anymore, so we're going to scrap that and I want to put this new policy in. I don't like the idea that I'm not allowed wives, I want many wives, so we'll just adjust that. He is to be completely true to God's word. That is the only authority he has. He, and, and this idea of writing out God's law would ensure that the king of Israel would have no excuse if he was to be faithless or disobedient because he would know God's law more than anyone else barring the Levitical priests in the land. And he was not only to read the scriptures, but let's carry on reading verses 19 to 20. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, 
and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. He was not merely to read the scriptures, he was to obey the scriptures. He was not to be uh, the guilty of the accusation, one rule for him, another for everyone else. His, he was to uh, himself keep God's law. Do you notice how, uh, how God says that he is, and this is a very interesting uh, phrase, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brother's. His brothers. He is part of the people. He is from among the people. He is not greater than the people. His authority comes from God as a steward of God. And therefore, just like his brothers, just like everyone else in Israel, just like everyone else in the covenant, he was to guard his heart and to keep God's word in every aspect of his work and way of life. He cannot say, that doesn't apply to me, I'm king. He is one of his brothers, one, like one of the brothers. In other words, God wanted his king to be someone who would rule the nation righteously, doing what is good in accordance with God's rule. He, is meant, he was meant to be, as David was described, a man after God's own heart, who would be faithful to the Lord in every way. And yet the reality is, as you read uh, through the kings of Israel and Judah, you discover that even the best of Israel's kings were men at best, And their hearts, at various moments, were turned from God towards sin. There's the king's appointment, the king's authority, but let's finally consider the king's ambition. See, Deuteronomy ends with, uh, as we saw last week, if you turn to chapter 28, uh, you see that Deuteronomy ends with a series of warnings of curses and promises of blessing for the people. Uh, To put it simply, if you obeyed God's law, if the people obeyed God's law when they came into the land, they could expect blessing from him. They could expect a good good king to rule over them. They could expect material blessings such as food and and drink and, uh, and, and safety and peace. But to disobey resulted in curses. It resulted in famine. It resulted in plague. Ultimately, it resulted in exile. And therefore, the ambition of the king, the whole aim of the king, is to lead the people into the blessings of the Lord. It is to do, the, it is to do as it were, to, to participate in the work of God in bringing blessing. And what do these blessings include? There's the blessing of peace. God says, come into my, when you come into my land, obey me, and I will give you rest from your enemies. And perhaps the, the greatest time of peace the nation ever experienced was in the days of Solomon. David, his father, had gone out and fought battles and, with the Lord's help, had defeated the various enemies of God's, of God's people. He was a, a man who, uh, who is described as really have, being a man of war. He, he was a, an expert uh, military tactician. He, 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 he was incredibly successful in, in rooting his enemies and defeating them. And, and Solomon was the beneficiary of this. Because uh, it, in Solomon's day, uh, the whole kingdom enjoyed a time where their enemies did not attack, where there, there was no war, there was no bloodshed. It was, it was peace in the kingdom. In fact, when, 
when David had defeated all of his enemies, this is what we read in 2 Samuel 7 verse 1. Now, when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the blessings included peace. But there was also not not only the blessing of peace, there was the blessing of presence. When David uh, experienced that rest, he asked the Lord if he could do something for him. Remember what that was? He wanted to build a temple. And the Lord said, no, David, uh, you are a warrior. You are a man who has shed blood. You are not the one to build a house for me. But what was denied to David was granted to Solomon. And under King Solomon, the temple was constructed. It was built in place of the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant that symbolized the presence of God among the people was brought into the most holy place. And uh, when uh, Solomon saw all of this, he prayed to, to God that this would be a place where the people would find forgiveness of sins. It would be a place where they would turn to in prayer and find blessings and, and such as uh, if there was a famine, they could pray to God and, and he would bring the rain uh, and, and bring the harvest. It, this, was, this was a momentous occasion in the life and history of Israel, in, in the land. And, and, and as Solomon finished his prayer, it would be a place where all the nations could come to as well. And when he had finished his, his prayer, we read this in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 1. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifice and... This is the whole point of the temple. This is what what the aim of it all was. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. God's presence with his people. God's presence in a permanent place, a place that would not be moved. God's people dwelling with God's presence among them. A real time of blessing under Solomon. And there was the blessing, thirdly, of prosperity. When peace... And presence was established, the the nation prospered. So much so that the nations surrounding them were envious. And they wanted to see for themselves what had happened. And we see uh, it almost looking like all the promises to Abraham being fulfilled. You remember how God, we saw uh, a couple of weeks ago, how God promised to Abraham that he would make him into a great nation, check. That he would um, give him a land, check. His descendants, that is. Uh, And that he would um, make him, uh, that he would bless him and curse those who curse him, uh, bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. Done that. And then that he would make him a blessing to all the nations. And we see this happening when the Queen of Sheba arrives into Jerusalem wanting to see the wisdom, the wealth and the work of Solomon uh, there in Jerusalem. She wanted to see his palace. She wanted to see the temple. She wanted to observe his wisdom. And she sees it all and she is utterly amazed, this uh, pagan queen. And we see something of, of... of the promises being fulfilled and it may you may have been tempted living in Solomon's day to say this is the best we've had it this is the blessings promised to Abraham being fulfilled right sort of it's a partial kingdom because those promises were being fulfilled Partially. Because what happens immediately after? Solomon has his heart turned away from God, building high places, because he acquired many many wives, much wealth. The kingdom is torn 
in two. Northern Kingdom, Israel. Southern Kingdom, Judah. The kings of Israel are compared to David. The kings of Judah, sorry, are compared to David. Is he as good as David or does he fall short? Some of them are pretty good. None of them good enough. The kings of Israel are another story. Each one of them seem to be, have their hand in wicked and do e- what's evil in the eyes of the Lord and lead the people into idolatry. And eventually, after God warned and God was patient and God showed his power, the people were taken into exile by invading armies. And we're left asking a question. If you're not, um, probably because you've been having a nap. Um, or, or because I'm just not preaching it well enough. Um, we're left asking the question, who is God's king? Who is God's king? Who is the one who t- described in uh, Deuteronomy? Who is the one who, who will come and deliver us from curse? Who will come and bring blessing again through his humble servant obedience to the law of God? Well, the answer is not found in a palace. The answer is not, is not found sitting on a throne. The answer is found on a man hanging on a cross outside of Jerusalem with a sign above him. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And all of these kings, all of these failing kings... Point uh, who are in the partial kingdom are simply pointing to the one true king who uh, was appointed by God to rule his people and bring them blessings from heaven. He would be the he was the righteous servant of God who humbled himself, taking uh, the form of a servant in human flesh and uh, coming into the world to save us from the curse of the law. And he goes to the cross and he dies for his people's sins. And God, uh, as he was condemned by men, he came to his own people and they said, not my king. And they put him on a cross and he was condemned by men. But in the plans and foreknowledge of God, that, that act of defiance by his people was being used to bring blessings to the nations, bringing forgiveness of sins, bringing... Uh, br- bringing the the hope of eternal life, bringing a relationship, a restored relationship with God. And as he was condemned by men, God vindicated him, raising him from the grave. So that, and, and Peter says in his uh, sermon at Pentecost on that, the, the birthday of the church in Jerusalem, speaking to the crowds who one time said, not my king, Dave, uh, Peter says, God has shown you by raising him from the dead that he is king and he is Lord. Despite your defiance, despite your protestations, despite you saying not my king, he is king. The question is, will you bow the knee? Will you confess with your mouth that he is Lord? Will you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Will you turn from your sins that bring curse, that your sins that bring judgment, your sins that, uh, that, throw, uh, that is like throwing your fists in the face of God? Will you turn from your sins and seek the pardon of the King, Jesus Christ. Because it is the honour of a King. It is the grand privilege of a King to overlook an offence. And this King, Jesus Christ, 
is willing to overlook even your offences because he's paid for your sins on the cross if you believe in him, if you bow the knee to him, if you own him as Lord and God. Let me simply ask you, is Jesus your king?